together to find out what the oxygen content is in the water. So today, we're going to figure out what the oxygen content is in venous blood. So it gives you normal venous values and it says that the pressure of oxygen in the veins is 46. It's actually 40 milliliters mercury. So can you make a correction on your total point? The relationship changes now. It should be a zero. So when the oxygen level drops to about 44 in the plasma, the hemoglobin is about 75% saturated, and that's normal. And it's a lot lower than arterial blood, and why would that be? Why would you expect the oxygen level to be lower in the venous blood than in arterial blood? Well, it's kind of from, you know, it's kind of from, the, from all the tissues of the body, it's coming from the radiation. So definitely the oxygen by that time, you know, is going to be there. So that's the reason I haven't gone through the process to get you know, the oxygen. Excuse me. Okay. So the, the tissues in the body extracted the oxygen, and that's why the content is not going So go ahead and fill in the formula for venous, or, or for oxygen content. You're going to use the same formula that we did for arterial, but you're going to use the venous values. Um, the hemoglobin, it tells you, is 15 grams per deciliter.
and the difference is five volumes per cent. So normally the tissues extract about five volumes per cent um, with normal metabolism. So we want to talk about why that would change. So what would cause an increased AVO2 difference? In other words, you would have an, an arterial O2 content of 20 volumes per cent, but maybe only 12 volumes per cent in the venous blood. So that's a lot more extraction of oxygen. Why would that happen? So this is what I want you to write. Um, core blood flow. And then in parentheses, write perfusion. Core perfusion to the tissues of the body. And this will be more causes and increase? Mm-hmm. Poor blood flow or perfusion to the tissues of the body. Or there could be increased cellular metabolism. Increased cellular metabolism. Increased cellular metabolism, such as fever and infection. So when the cells have, in response to an infection, that's, um, the cells produce more energy. And if they're producing more energy, they need more oxygen. So they're going to extract more oxygen because of that. So that's why with an infection, with a fever, you have increased metabolism, you have increased oxygen usage. All right, now what would cause a decrease? Oh, and then I didn't explain with the blood flow. So let me explain that. Uh, when there isn't enough blood flow going to the tissues, the tissues become hypoxic. And then when, uh, when some blood does flow by and bring some oxygen to the tissues, the tissues will extract more than normal because they're hypoxic. So if they're starved of oxygen, when some oxygen does come by, they pull more than the normal amount. So poor perfusion, you're going to have an increased AVO2 difference because the cells are going to extract more oxygen as the um, blood does flow to the tissues and bring that fresh supply of oxygen. What would cause a decreased AVO2 difference? In other words, um, you have 20 volumes per cent in the arterial blood, the blood flows to the tissues of the body, but then on the venous side, you've got a really high saturation, a high oxygen content. It's like, what the heck is going on? Why didn't the tissues utilize the oxygen? Um, so usually it's um, cyanide poisoning. So the cells are not utilizing O2, such as cyanide poisoning. <coughs> cells are not utilizing O2, such as with cyanide poisoning, or with severe sepsis. Initially, there's going to be an increase in metabolism, an increased oxygen usage, but then as the patient gets worse and worse and they're deteriorating, the cells stop utilizing oxygen. So, severe sepsis, they're getting ready to die basically, their cells stop utilizing oxygen. So that would give us um, a decreased ABO2 difference because the cells didn't pull the oxygen from the blood. Um, I'm sure it would be an accident or somebody trying to kill you. <laughs> um, I guess some people are trying to commit suicide will ingest cyanide. Um, kids get into it. No. Cardiac output can be calculated by knowing the ABO2 difference. 
and it's called the Fick Equation. And the Fick Equation becomes one of those trivial pursuit <coughs> kind of things where you need to know about it, but is it absolutely necessary at the bedside when you're working in critical care with the patients? No, because if we want to figure out cardiac output, then it's either using thermal dilution, it's using an echocardiogram, it's not using the Fick Equation. Um, but it still comes up. I mean, you still get quizzed about it. It's still on your national exam. Um, so I'm still going to teach it. You don't have to plug numbers into it for the test, but you do have to know the equation. Right. So the equation is, at the bottom, um, cardiac output is equal to oxygen consumption, the VO2 is oxygen consumption, divided by the AVO2 difference, and then you multiply everything by 10. It doesn't look like that. I wonder if this parenthesis was moved over. Would you understand to do O2 consumption, divide by the ABO2 difference, and then when you get your answer, multiply by 10? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe move the parenthesis over. Output. So oxygen consumption is mLs. Um, AVO2 difference is mLs per 100 mLs of blood. So the mLs cancel out. You've got 100 mLs of blood times 10 would give you liters. And that's where you get your cardiac output. Well, not everybody's oxygen consumption is 250 mLs per minute. If they have an infection, um, O2 consumption will be up. So this equation isn't super reliable. It's just more in theory. Okay, so fix equation, your oxygen consumption, divide by ABO2 difference, multiply by Now, just a picture from um, all those math practice problems that you have in D2L practice. I got from a math book. I think I told you that already. Uh, the math book is really old. The publisher wasn't interested in making a new math book, but the concepts stay the same. And sometimes I like the simpleness of the pictures, trying to understand things. Um, so it shows blood flowing through the body, it shows the tissues, and then of course oxygen leaves the tissue, um, the blood and goes into the tissues. Um, the tissues consume about 250 mLs of oxygen per minute, and where's our ABO2 difference? Okay, so it's not showing content. It's just showing oxygen and um, mLs per liter. But there's a lot here, there's less here, and the difference between it is gives you the equation. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the oxygen dissociation curve. And the oxygen dissociation curve has everything to do with the hemoglobin saturated with oxygen and the amount of oxygen dissolved in the plasma. So the two have a relationship with each other. And it's not, um, what's the word, a linear relationship. It's not like if there's one tour of oxygen dissolved in the plasma, there's 1% hemoglobin. So it doesn't work and, and give you a straight line. Um, it gives you an S shape. All right, what does this say? The oxygen dissociation curve reflects the relationship between the plasma PO2, so the pressure of oxygen in the plasma, and the percent to which the hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. It's very important to understand when determining the proper oxygen level for a patient. It says, remember, it is all in the curve. So we'll go through the curve, and once you get an understanding of it, then we'll go back and apply um, how important is this to know when you're at the bedside of the patient. Right, so here's the oxygen. 
friction dissociation curve. And on the x-axis, we have the pressure of oxygen, which is the thing that's dissolved in the plasma. And on the y-axis, we have the percent saturation of the hemoglobin. <clears throat> and notice the shape is like an S. So what that tells us is, we talk about normal oxygen saturation. We say normal is 90 to 100 torr per millimeters mercury in the plasma. And the saturation is about 98%. So that's how you would find that point on this curve. So 90 torr, go up to where you have about a 98% saturation. I can't draw this um, And this is the point on the curve that we see. So I'm going to have you guys draw your own oxyhemoglobin dissociation. <laughs> so I'm going to give you this handout, and on one side it has um, a blank curve, and it gives you all the numbers, and you have to plot the numbers. So you would go PaO2, find it down here, O2 saturation, find it here, and then you're going to put a dot. And then when you're all done, you connect all the dots. And then the other side is for a little bit later.
Two knots. Does it look like this? That's not good. My life a little more shaky. Yeah. <laughs> and that's okay. It's just so, so you can understand what the oxygen dissociation curve is and the fact that it's not linear, but it does have a curve to it. Why is it simple? Um, before we go to the next slide, I'll point to the picture and then we'll read the slides. Um, so because of the shape of the oxygen association curve, you see that it's kind of flat on the top. And the significance of that is as the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the plasma increases, there's a point where it really doesn't increase oxygen saturation of the hemoglobin very much. So once you get past a certain point, you don't really gain a whole lot by increasing the oxygen level in the patient because the oxygen saturation doesn't change a whole lot. Um, for example, if we have an oxygen saturation of 90%, it's at the where the curve starts to flatten out. So anything above 90% would really, really don't gain much hemoglobin oxygen saturation. However, what if we go below that? Look at how it starts to drop. So below 90% um, hemoglobin saturation, there's a big drop in the PO2 or the pressure of oxygen in the plasma. So if you're wondering why you're at the bedside, you see a lot of physician orders, you know, keep stats above 90%. Well, what's the big deal about 90%? Why not 92 or why not 85? And the answer is all in the curve. Because if we keep the saturation 90% and higher, um, we're keeping the hemoglobin pretty well saturated. We don't gain much more after that. But if we let the saturation drop below 90, now it starts dropping rapidly with small changes in PO2. So we're going to compromise um, oxygen delivery to the tissues if we let the saturation fall below 90%. Right. 
So let me, the slides say the same thing. Note how the saturation of hemoglobin increases slightly beyond 90%, even if the PaO2 increases a lot. So hemoglobin 90%, you see a PaO2 of about 60 millimeters of mercury. We go up 7%, PaO2 goes up 24 to 80. We go from 97 to 98, PaO2 80 to 100. So 24 increase, yet we don't gain a whole lot in the hemoglobin saturation. Note how steep the curve is when the oxygen saturation goes below 90%. In this part of the curve, a small change in PaO2 results in a big change in the hemoglobin saturation. So that's why we try to avoid having arterial oxygen saturation lower than 90%. So write that down. Keep patients PaO2 greater than 60 millimeters mercury. I'll repeat it. Keep the patients PA, this is little a, PaO2 greater than 60 millimeters mercury. And keep the SaO2, so capital S, little a, O2, it's a saturation of hemoglobin in the stream of blood. Um, capital S, little a, O2 greater than 90% to be safe. Okay, so that's your goal for most patients. And there's going to be exceptions that you come across, but first you have to learn the basics. And the basics is keep SATs greater than 90% and keep the PaO2 60 milliliters mercury or better. So that's different than normal, isn't it? You said normal saturation is about 98%. Normal PaO2 is 90 to 100. So you see how we have a little bit of a area to play with. So if somebody is sick and their oxygen saturation drops a little bit, it doesn't mean they have to get put on oxygen to bring it back to 98%. As long as it's greater than 90%, then we're safe. Does that make sense? So this oxyhemoglobin curve gets affected by different things going on in the blood. So the title of this says the effects of PCO2, the pH, the temperature, and 2,3-DPG. Um, so those four items are going to change how oxygen is attached to hemoglobin. The first bullet says that hemoglobin will release oxygen differently depending on the surrounding environment. So sometimes it's going to hold on to oxygen really tight, sometimes it's going to let go. Next bullet. Will an acidic environment cause an increased affinity or a decreased affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen? So acidic environment means the pH drops below normal in the blood. So if you want to put that in parentheses or make yourself a little note, as acidic environment would be a low pH in the blood. So is that going to cause an increased affinity? And what that means is, does hemoglobin hang on more tightly to oxygen? So when you see increased affinity, you've got a picture in your mind of hemoglobin hanging on to an oxygen molecule and not letting go. It's got its grip on, it's increased affinity, it's holding on really tight. Decreased affinity would be when it lets go more easily than normal. So in an acidic environment, does it cause an increased affinity or a decreased affinity? It causes a decreased affinity. So it lets go more easily if the pH is lower than normal. You got that written down? Uh, will increased levels of carbon dioxide 
cause an increased affinity or a decreased affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. Um, carbon dioxide is kind of like an acid in the blood. So does that kind of help you with the answer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's the same. It's going to cause a decreased affinity. If we have a higher than normal amount of carbon dioxide in the blood, um, it's going to cause oxygen to be let go from the hemoglobin more easily. Decreased affinity. Now with the blood temperature, will an increased blood temperature cause increased affinity or a decreased affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen? So increased blood temperature, that would be like having a fever or being sick. Um, and usually the body makes sense. So do you think the body would want to let go of hemoglobin easily and let the tissues have it? Or would it not want to let go of the tissue, uh, let go of the oxygen? It would want to let go because you've got increased metabolism in the tissues to try to fight the infection. Oh, sweet. It's going to want to let go. It's going to have a decreased affinity so that oxygen is released more readily into the tissues. And the next bullet asks about the opposite. What if your body is really cold? How does that affect oxygen affinity um, or hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen? Yeah, it's going to be the opposite where it's going to hold on more tightly. So cold body temperature, increased affinity of oxygen and hemoglobin. blood cell, it's called 2,3-DPG. 2,3 um, is the position of the phosphate groups on the carbon. Do you do know that? Uh, the name of the chemical is diphosphoglycerate. Do you know that? 2,3-DPG <laughs> is good. So if you say 2,3-DPG to any respiratory therapist, they're going to understand what you're talking about. Uh, but anyway, the, the presence of this chemical in the red blood cell helps oxygen release from the hemoglobin. And it asks, will a decreased amount of 2,3-DPG cause increased affinity or a decreased affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen? So if you don't have that chemical, what do you think happens? Yeah, it holds on. It can't let go because it doesn't have that chemical that allows it to let go. So if you don't have enough 2,3-DPG in the red blood cell, you have increased affinity because it can't let go. So that happens with stored blood in your brain. What would cause an increased amount of 2,3-DPG? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so, um, when you donate blood and it gets stored, um, while it's stored, 2,3-DPG goes away. There, there isn't any being produced by the red blood cell. So when a patient is given um, red blood cells, you, know, you need a tr blood transfusion and they give them red blood cells, it takes about a day before the 2,3-DPG builds back up in those red blood cells before oxygen gets released to the tissues. So if we see somebody who's anemic and we think, oh, they got a blood transfusion, well, it takes a good day before that makes a difference in O2 delivery to the tissues. Because there isn't 2,3-DPG in the red blood cell, so oxygen is letting go and going into the tissues. So it just hangs on to the hemoglobin until the body builds up the 2,3-DPG. Okay, so the curve shifts. That's another big, it's almost like slang when you say the curve shifts. So let me explain it to you. Um, there's three curves shown here. I don't know why they colored between them. Here they colored it purple, here they colored red. But there's actually, it's showing three oxygen dissociation curves. In the middle is the normal oxygen dissociation curve. 
On the right is what the curve would look like if we had acidosis, if we had high CO2, if we had an increased temperature, and we got our pencil out and colored in all the dots and made our graph, it would look like it was actually shifted over from the normal. And so instead of saying there's a decreased affinity of um, hemoglobin and oxygen, we would say the curve shifted to the right. It doesn't really, it shifts because if you're to plot it, it is moved over. Um, but the bottom line is that hemoglobin is letting go more easily than the oxygen. When there's acidosis, when there's high CO2, when there's a high temperature, when there's high levels, it can cause high levels of 2 pdg I don't have an answer for that one. Abnormal hemoglobins, we have a shift to the right. And then, if the body is cold, or there's alkalosis, a high pH in the blood, lower than normal CO2, low levels of 2,3-DPG. If we have carboxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, and then it says abnormal again over here. Um, the hemoglobin is going to hang on more tightly to the oxygen. It's going to look like the curve has actually been shifted over to the left. So shift to the left, hemoglobin is hanging on to oxygen. Shift to the right, hemoglobin is letting go of the oxygen. showing the same thing. Uh, a normal pH in the blood is 7.40. So when the pH is normal, then hemoglobin and oxygen can associate normally. If the pH is lower than normal, that's acidosis. And now hemoglobin lets go of oxygen more easily. So increased affinity. If the pH is higher than normal, that causes alkalosis and it makes the hemoglobin hang on to the oxygen one thing. Can you say that? Higher? Um, yeah, high alkalosis. pH is alkalosis. And then a picture showing changes in temperature and how that affects oxygen and hemoglobin. 37 degrees Celsius is a normal blood temperature. 42 degrees Celsius is a fever. And when there's fever in the body, then hemoglobin lets go of the oxygen more easily. Hypothermia, where the body is really cold, now the hemoglobin is hanging onto the oxygen more tightly. It's not being released to the tissues as well. is like a reference point. Sometimes instead of saying the curve has shifted, um, even when you get a, when you put the arterial blood into a blood gas machine and you run the blood, it's part of your responsibilities. And you get a printout of the values. Sometimes it prints out the P50. And the P50 is another way of saying, oh, the curve has shifted to the right. The curve has shifted to the left. Instead, it tells you this number, this P50. So let me explain it. Um, the P50 is the pressure of oxygen in the blood plasma when the hemoglobin is 50% saturated with oxygen. So you look on the curve and you find saturation of hemoglobin at uh, 50% and you look to see what the PaO2 is. And I cast it off. There's a coming up. It's going to be so here it is. So 50% saturation of the hemoglobin, we go over to this point, and we hit the line, and then we go down to see what the PaO2 is, and it's 27 millimeters of mercury. So in normal P50, 27 millimeters of mercury, and that tells us that the oxyhemoglobin curve is in a normal position. The oxygen association curve is in a normal position. However, what if we 
have acidosis, and this is our curve. You see, we look for a hemoglobin saturation of 50%, and see what the PaO2 is. Yeah, about 32 or 33 torr. <clears throat> so if you get a printout on your blood gas sheet and it says P50 is 33 torr, what are you going to think in your mind? Yeah, so the curve is shifted to the right, uh, there's hemoglobin is letting go of oxygen more easily. That's what you can assume from the P50. And then what if it goes the other way? Instead of being 27, and what if it's 20? So the P50 is 20. What assumption could you make? Alkalosis, yeah. And shift to the left, very good. So on the back of the handout that I gave you, Find out what the P50 is at those different temperatures in the blood. So at 32 degrees Celsius, what is the P50? So you find where the hemoglobin is 50% saturated, go over to that line where it's 32 degrees Celsius. 20, 20, 20 yes, very good, 24. So normal at 37 degrees, it should be about 27 torr, 27 millimeters, so right here. Looks like it's a little bit less, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, to me it looks like 25 on this curve. Mm -hmm. And then what about with fever, 42 degrees Celsius? About 32. You see 34? 33. 33? Yeah. Okay. So, about 33 torr. Alright, so that's just a clue of the, um, the status of oxygen being delivered to the tissues in your patient when you get that. abnormalities. There's 120 different types of hemoglobin abnormalities and in respiratory we typically deal with maybe four or five of them. One of them that we deal with is carboxyhemoglobin. It's when carbon monoxide is being inhaled and it gets into the, the blood. Carbon monoxide loves hemoglobin. And when it combines with hemoglobin, it does not let go. It hangs on. Um, it takes the body about 24 hours to get rid of extra um, carbon monoxide from the blood or proxy hemoglobin. Um, so it hangs on really tight. Well, the problem with it is that it affects how oxygen is released from the other hemoglobin. So even if you've got a hemoglobin with carbon monoxide, it's going to affect the hemoglobins around it that have the oxygen. And they're going to hang on to their oxygen more tightly. So that's why it's dangerous to breathe in a lot of carbon monoxide. Um, cigarette smokers uh, typically have like 7-8% carboxyhemoglobin in their blood. Um, if somebody is in a fire, carbon monoxide is given off in a fire as a byproduct of, of something burning. And inhaling that gives you much higher. If the level is too high, if the level is high, 10%, um, I have the numbers to give you in a second. Um, but if the number is like greater than 10 or 12%, then when the patient comes into the ER, you put them on a non-rebreather mask, and breathing 100% oxygen gets rid of the carboxyhemoglobin a lot faster. I think it's a couple hours. I'll give you the details in a second. Um, if it's really high, then they get put into a hyperbaric chamber, and that way they can give several atmospheres of pure oxygen 
and that gets rid of it like within an hour. So that's the danger of it. Okay, so for notes. Um, Carboxyhemoglobin, COHB, is carbon monoxide attached to hemoglobin. The affinity of hemoglobin for carbon monoxide is 210 times greater than its affinity for oxygen. Once carbon monoxide combines with hemoglobin, that molecule cannot carry oxygen. <coughs> this also impairs the other hemoglobins from releasing oxygen. And then half-life means how long does it take for half of it to go away? The half-life of carboxyhemoglobin is five hours if you're breathing room air. Um, the half-life of carboxyhemoglobin is an hour and a half if you're breathing 100% oxygen. And before we talk about pulse ox readings, let me give you some of the notes. So 1 to 2% of all HB has CO. 1% to 2% of all HB, of all hemoglobin, has CO, carbon monoxide. 1% to 2%. And then write, this is normal. It comes from the atmosphere. And it comes from breakdown of red blood cells. So that's going to give us our 1% or 2% uh, HPCO or carboxyhemoglobin. Um, cigarette smokers. Five percent to eight percent. HBCO. Five percent to eight percent. Five percent to eight percent of HBCO. Carboxyhemoglobin. Yes. 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 Yeah, that's what. Is there a difference? No. You said five yeah. to ten percent. Yeah, it's the same. COHB, HBC. So what does that mean? They retain that um, percentage? I have it here as COHB, but say that again? They retain that percentage if you smoke. Yeah, so when you smoke, there's carbon monoxide from the cigarette smoke. Um, the carbon, carbon monoxide will be absorbed by the blood. It will attach to the hemoglobin. And then if you measure your hemoglobin, you're going to typically see 5% of all of your hemoglobin has carbon monoxide on it. Increase Up to 8%. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Like it is like a chain. Yeah, chain smoke or impact today. Probably smoke would be higher than the higher the level, the faster it needs to be treated. The higher the level, the faster it needs to be treated. And did I tell you about smoke inhalation? Mm -hmm. Do you want to write that down too? Mm -hmm. um, with smoke inhalation, treat with non-rebreather mass, 100% O2. Um, yeah, non rebreather mask doesn't deliver pure 100% O2, but it's close to, the closest we have to get to 100%. So we say approximately 100%, knowing that we're not getting pure 100%, we're just getting close to it. Something like 
Yeah, so like maybe you just three. Um, with a non rebreather mass? It's about 80%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it would depend on the minute ventilation of the person, how well the mask is fitting on their face. So, under ideal circumstances, could you get higher than 80%? Probably. Yeah. I think if you look at a range, they kind of average it out to 80%. So, for this class purpose, 80%? Um, and then hyperbaric chamber is needed for, I don't have a percentage listed by if the carboxyhemoglobin <coughs> percentage is this, then they go to hyperbaric. So I don't have that listed in my notes. I can find it in the textbook, but I don't have that in my notes. So I, and how high does the, um, the carboxyhemoglobin have to be before they actually go to a hyperbaric chain? So I don't have that exact number in there. And then one more thing to write about it is when there's a high level of carboxyhemoglobin in the blood, it causes a cherry red color to the skin. So cherry red causes like a, a reddish glow <laughs> to the skin. A cherry red color to the skin. So if you're given a scenario, you know, a patient was in a fire, um, and now they're being assessed, and you notice that they have a cherry red skin color. Um, does this mean that they're oxygenating well, and they don't need to be put on a non-rebreather mask? And you would say, no, it doesn't mean that. <laughs> you know, they probably have carbon monoxide poisoning. So it's, that's how that information is usually given to you. All right, and then you have the bottom of the slide that says pulse oximetry readings with a question mark. Well, the, the dilemma with putting a patient on a pulse oximeter is carboxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin both absorb the very same wavelength of light. So carboxyhemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, they're, they're going to give you the same percentage. So if you do pulse oximetry, Carboxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin are going to combine and it's going to show you this really good percentage of oxygen. So that's the danger of using a pulse oximeter with a patient who's been exposed to carbon monoxide. How do you want to write that in your notes? What did you write, Julie? Danger, COHB and HBO2 absorb the same way of light and accurate. Reading? Perfect. You want to write that? You have something different? What did you write? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> I just can't believe she wrote all that so quick. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say it again? Yeah. Mm. Uh, danger, COHB, and HBO2 absorb the same wavelength of light and accurate reading. Not you thought I was fast. <laughs> okay, I'll settle that. So causes of an inaccurate reading with pulse oximetry. You would mention carboxyhemoglobin as an inaccurate reading. So you would have to draw an ABG, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, another abnormality that we come across a lot, and the blood gas machine will print out the different types of um, hemoglobins that are found in the blood. There's a limit, not 120. We usually seven of them. 
Um, the other one that it keeps track of is methemoglobin. Um, so METHB is the abbreviation for methemoglobin. Um, this is hemoglobin when the iron is in the ferric state instead of the ferrous state. It doesn't say that, does it? So the three pluses, F-E-R-R-I-C, the ferric state, so it's got an extra um, positive charge to it. And then the F-E with the two pluses, that's called the ferrous state, F-E-R-R-O-U-S, ferrous state. So the problem with hemoglobin being in the ferric state is that once oxygen combines with this, it cannot be released. So that becomes a permanent um, fixture of oxygen with hemoglobin. <coughs> Thank you. Right, so why does this happen? Well, it's caused by nitrates. So if you cook your steak on a grill, and all the nitrates from the charcoal go up into your steak and eat, and eat that steak. You've got a lot of nitrates in your blood. It's going to cause your med hemoglobin to go up. Not that much. You don't have to <laughs> um, Medications. So really high blood pressure is treated with nitrates. So um, like nitroprusside, um, angina to try to open vasodilate the coronary arteries, nitroglycerin. Um, those are all nitrates and will cause a rise in the hemoglobin. And then the other one is use of lidocaine. You've heard of lidocaine to numb, I don't know, baby has a toothache, you put lidocaine on their, their achy teeth or whatever, and it stops the pain. Well, when that gets absorbed into the blood, then it can cause an increase in that hemoglobin. So, you know, small exposure to lidocaine, small exposure to nitrates, nothing happens. It's just that large um, exposure does cause a lot of that hemoglobin to be produced, and then it becomes a problem. All right, so let me give you some normals. Normal is less than 1%. Typically, 0.4% to 0.8%. Typically, 0.4% to 0.8%. That's normal. Normal. Um, treat it if greater than 5%. Treat it if greater than 5%. Treat with methylene blue. M-E-T-H-Y-L-E-N-E. -E -E. Methylene blue. Um, so this is a dye. It's used when they're doing a like a vascular scanning, and they have to dye the blood so they can see it on x-ray. It's used to color tube feedings, like if you're concerned that tube feedings are getting into the lungs. Sometimes you can suction the patient's trachea, and you get this cream-colored secretions, and the tube feeding that's going in is cream-colored. And you wonder, well, is it, are we suctioning tube feeding out of the patient's lungs? Um, so methylene blue is usually added to the tube feedings to make it blue. So if you're suctioning blue out of the lungs, then you know that the fluid from the stomach is getting into the patient's lungs. Um, they could have a fistula between the trachea and the esophagus. Um, they just could be regurgitating it, aspirating it into their lungs. So that's, the, that's typically the uses for methylene blue. But it does treat high methemoglobin. We'll get rid of the high And it causes a brown, rusty color to the skin, usually at high levels. I think I've only seen that like once in a patient. 
question. Okay. It says it cannot release, you can't, cannot release the O2. It never releases it? Correct. It becomes permanent. Okay. Time for a break. <clears throat> Julie, can you hit the red button on the left? So another hemoglobin abnormality is sickle cell hemoglobin. Um, this is an inherited disease. When the red blood cell deoxygenates, the red blood cell changes from a biconcave to a curved sickle shape. The sickle-shaped cell is fragile and subject to rupture. It tangles with other red blood cells and causes thromboemboli, which are blood clots. This may block flow through small vessels, creating painful areas of ischemia or tissue hypoxia. Um, the patient also develops anemia. So treatment is blood transfusion. And yeah, they get um they call it an acute A C U T E acute chest syndrome where they get a lot of uh, infarctive tissue in the lungs because when the blood is flowing through the capillaries, there's a lot of clots. And so then they don't get good blood flow to certain areas and it's painful and they have chest pain. and So they need a lot of pain meds. Um, pediatric ICU, I know it's been a challenge with a few patients. They end up on the ventilator, they end up on an oscillator. So yeah, it's a challenging disease. Um, what is cyanosis? It tells you that it's a bluish appearance of the skin. It's usually noted in areas where the capillary beds lie close to the surface of the skin. So, um, best place is to look at the mucosa, so around the lip area. So it doesn't matter what the skin pigment is. When you're looking at the lip area, you can still see cyanosis. Um, so they say the lips and mucous membrane. So that would be, what, inside the mouth, I guess. So you could have cyanosis just because you don't have blood flowing to a certain area of the skin. And it can happen, have you ever sat in a cold room and then you drink a cold soda or cold water and you get really cold and when you look at your fingertips, they're blue. You're still oxygenating well, but because there's low perfusion to your fingertips, it looks blue. So cyanosis could just be that you have poor perfusion going to the periphery. But with central cyanosis, so the, the blue lips, um, the blue mucous membranes, that's caused from hypoxemia. And what happens is if five grams percent of hemoglobin is desaturated, not carrying oxygen, it changes the color of the blood. All right, so five grams, we have good images. Um, I don't have anything right for the five grams of desaturated hemoglobin. But how low does the saturation have to be before cyanosis occurs? It would be less than 88%. So hemoglobin saturation less than 88% will cause cyanosis. So by the time you see cyanosis in somebody, their oxygen level is really low. Uh, we're not talking, you know, 90% or, you know, it's just a little bit low. So it's got to be less than 88% before they actually look <clears throat> um, However, patients with severe anemia don't become, they don't look cyanotic with a low oxygen content. And it's asking you why. Oh, let me read the answer. I might have to read it slow so you can write it down. Um, so severe anemia doesn't look cyanotic um, because five grams of their hemoglobin would have to be without oxygen. 
So their saturation would end up being about 50% before you'd see cyanosis in them. So you want me to just say that slow so you can write it all down? Mm -hmm. Okay. So because five grams of, of, of HB, because five grams of HB would have to be without O2, Saturation would have to be 50% or less. So it has to be 5 grams of what's there. What if your hemoglobin level is only 10? So like half of all of your hemoglobin would have to be without oxygen before you'd actually see cyanosis in somebody who's anemic. So they don't look cyanotic if their oxygen level goes low. But boy, can you tell because of how pale they usually look? They look ghostly. They look ghostly, don't they? Yeah, with the um, bariatric surgery that's being done by a lot of people, um, iron is absorbed by the stomach. So when this part of the stomach is removed or banded, <laughs> then they don't have the same iron absorption. And hemoglobin tends to drop because the body's not making red blood cells, it doesn't have the iron, and they become like, like pasty pale. So, no, I don't recommend bariatric surgery. <laughs> doesn't seem healthy. Um, so can you see how some good critical thinking questions can come from this information? So when you're studying, think of different ways you could put it together, and then that prepares you for the test better also. Question? I just have a question to make sure I understand it. With the, with someone who's anemic, they, their blood is already low. So are you saying that they wouldn't normally get the bluish color because it would, because their blood is already low, it would, they would have to go to 50% or less in order for us to see that? Side, not that cyanosis side change in yes. this as opposed to a normal person? Perfect. Yes. Very good. Yeah. <coughs> Cece, that's in the SAO2. Right? Yes. When you're looking at hemoglobin saturation, yeah, yeah S, capital S, little A, O2 saturation. And this is where I have written down. Um, Hemoglobin is normally 12 to 15 grams per deciliter, and I don't think I told you that when we were talking about hemoglobin. I just said normal is about 15 grams. Yeah. Um, so write this down. Um, hemoglobin, of course, you can abbreviate it HB or HGB, whatever you want. 12 to 15 grams per deciliter is a normal level. Less than 10 grams per deciliter is considered anemia. Probably less than or equal to 10. Do you know how to make that? The less than, and then if you put a line underneath it, less than or equal to 10 is um, anemia. All right, you got that? And then less than eight, is blood transfusion is indicated. So HB less than eight grams per deciliter, blood transfusion is indicated. Just so you know what anemia means. Okay, now the, the famous equation in respiratory school. This is what we talk about at people are doing. Can you remember that stupid shunt equation? <laughs> um, so it's an involved equation. It's like four equations that have to come together into one. <laughs> so that means there's four chances to make a mistake to get it correct. <laughs> Um, but the purpose of the shunt equation is to figure out how much blood that's going to the lungs and going back to the left heart is not picking up oxygen. Now, 
What percent of the blood is being shunted past the lungs and not picking up oxygen? So that's what you would find out from this equation. A large percentage of shunted blood returning to the left heart is clinically significant. This percentage of cardiac output, or the mixed venous blood, shunted through non-ventilated space can be calculated. Use the following formula to calculate the percentage of shunted blood. All right, so um, QS over QT. It's shunted blood flow over total blood flow. So does it tell you that here? And QS equals shunted portion of the cardiac output and percentage. QT equals total cardiac output. All right, so what we have to fill in is the CaO2, the CvO2, and the CCO2. And some of this you recognize, right? Mm -hmm. How do you calculate arterial content, um, arterial oxygen content? So it would be the same formula, the hemoglobin times 1.34 times the O2 stat and the plasma, it's dissolved in the plasma. So that part stays the same. Um, you calculate the mixed venous oxygen content, same formula, you just plug in the values. Um, and then what's different is CCO2, it's capillary oxygen content. And it would be, you're trying to figure out what the ideal oxygen content would be if the patient's lungs were perfect. Ideal oxygen content. And the way that you figure it out is you always use 100% saturation, always, always, always. So CCO2, always, always, always use 100%. And when you convert 100% into decimal form, what does it become? One. one. Just the number one. So 100% is just the number one. The other thing is you use alveolar oxygen pressure. Because you're assuming that it's a perfect lung and all of the oxygen in the alveoli would make it into the capillaries. So whatever you calculate for alveolar oxygen is what you put into the equation. So this would give you an ideal capillary oxygen content. Then when you go back to the formula, you just plug the numbers in. So your ideal oxygen content minus arterial oxygen content, divide by ideal capillary content minus venous oxygen content. So you're getting the difference between the two. And then when you do, you multiply by 100, and you come up with the percentage of your shot. All right, want to try one out? Sure. OK, I'm going to give you the information you're going to need, um, arterial oxygen content, so write capital C, little a, O2. Capital C, little a, O2, arterial oxygen content is 18 volumes per cent. Second, write this down. Um, capital C, little v, O2, content of venous oxygen is 14 volumes per cent. Alveolar oxygen pressure, so that's P, capital A, O2, equals 200 millimeters mercury. And the hemoglobin level is 15 grams. All right, so I've just given you all the information that you need to figure out the shot. Right. Do you see anything you have to calculate before you can Plug in. Yeah, you have to calculate the CCO2 or the capillary oxygen content. So why don't you go ahead and do that now?
interested? Yes. Yes. Okay. I have a question for the um, for that shunt equation. It seemed really easy, so is there, like, you're not going to provide all those numbers, are you? Possibly. So he began. Thank you. 